Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining um, us this afternoon. This is the um, rerun of our Wills Trusts and Probate seminar uh, with myself and Paul Lakin, who uh, hopefully you can see on the video on the right hand side. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Faye Collinson and I'm going to be speaking first on the topic of errors in wills and how to correct them. Uh, before I launch into that, I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, I have attempted, uh, hopefully, to mute you all. Uh, that's not to silence you all, but just to help um, Paul and I um, with um, no distractions during the seminar. You can, I'm told, there should be a button that will say switch to the view of speaker, which is on the top left of your screen. I'm told that if you uh, press on that, you can then see uh, a view of me and Paul as we're speaking. In terms of questions, you'll also see, I think, at the bottom of your screen, um, a chat function, which I'm just hoping uh, bringing up here. Um, you can use this to interact with us. Now, you can send um, messages to either everybody or you can send a message individually to any of the attendees, it seems. So by all means, if you do wish to ask questions, then please do feel free to use the chat function. What we would ask is if you wouldn't mind leaving your um, email address or number just in case we don't get the opportunity to um, answer that question so that Paul and I uh, can come back to you after the seminar. For those of you that regularly attend our seminars, you'll know that we, we do hold them quite frequently. And it seems that at the moment, Zoom is uh, going to be the way in which we're gonna to have to be holding those certainly over the next few um, months. We are um, happy and in fact I invite you to let us know if there are any topics that would be a particular assistance to you. So if there's something that we've not spoken on before, uh, but you would like us to, then please do get in touch with us. You can see the email at the bottom of the slide there, seminars at kingschambers.com. So please feel free to drop us an email letting us know what you'd like to speak us to speak on. And also we'd be very grateful after the seminar, if you do have uh, a couple of moments, to drop us an email just with some feedback about the seminar. We always like to learn where we can improve uh, and what we've done um, well. I, I can see certainly on my screen at the moment that a number of you have turned off your videos. Um, do feel free to turn on your video. It's always nice to see everybody, especially when we've all been working from home uh, for a number of weeks uh, and certainly the only faces that I've seen are my 20-year-old uh, student brother and my husband. So it would be nice to see some of you. Um, and ho I'm hoping that for those that I can see, uh, can you all hear me okay? Get some nods and yeses. Great, okay. Now, what we will do after the seminar is we will email you all with a copy of my slides. Paul has produced a PDF that he's going to be using. So we will email that to you afterwards. So don't be too worried uh, about taking um, notes. And of course, feel free to um, disseminate those amongst your colleagues as well. Um, before I launch into things, I am gonna let you know about a couple of future seminars and, and certainly in the not too distant future. We are holding, and by we, I mean Paul and I, on the 24th of April, um, so that is this Friday at 12 p.m. A quite short um, seminar on executing wills and lasting power of attorneys uh, in the current lockdown. The idea is that to be short and sweet so you can squeeze that in on your lunch hour. Secondly, on the 30th of April, so that's uh, a week Thursday at 4 p.m., Paul and I will be holding a Q&A session on court protection, property and affairs matters. So we do hope you can join us for either of those. The latter seminar, the invites haven't gone out yet, but they will be doing soon, I think tomorrow. And what we do ask that if you have any burning questions that um, you just want to run that past somebody, especially because we're all working out of the office, so we've not got the chance to do that so much with our colleagues, then send that question to the seminars at King's Chambers email and we are going to formulate all those into an order so that we can address them 
at uh, the seminar on the 30th. But for today, uh, we have two topics. As I say, I'm going to be dealing with errors in wills and how to correct them. And then I'm going to hand over to Paul and he is going to be dealing with post-death variations. There you have our contact details. We're both uh, quite frequent users of Twitter. Our emails are there. Do feel free to ask us any questions or drop us any queries in the future. Uh, one thing we always pride ourselves on here at King's Chambers is that we are specialists. So Paul and I specialise in wills, trusts and probate work and also property affairs, court of protection work. We don't dabble and we're assisted by, um, in particular, our two clerks who are based uh, in Leeds, Louise and Luke and there are their emails and they will of course be delighted to assist you should you need any assistance in the future. So getting started with errors in wills. Now, most errors in wills will often transpire uh, once the testator has passed away. Um, and so for today's purposes, I'm going to be focusing on uh, two ways of dealing with that. The first is construction uh, and the second is rectification. There is, of course, the option of dealing with uh, variation. I'm not going to deal with that because Paul is dealing with post-death variations, but that is certainly something to bear in mind if it transpires that in one of your cases there is an error in a will. Before I move on to the post-death errors and ways in which to correct them, I just wanted to highlight for you that if it transpires that you have a testator and that testator has lost capacity after their will has been executed, and for some reason or another it transpires that there is an error within that will, but of course the testator has lost capacity so can't execute a new one, uh, there is always the option of dealing with that by way of a statutory will. It would be a complete disservice for me to attempt to deal with that in any detail today. Certainly I have done on a number of other occasions given uh, seminars on statutory wills. But just bear that in mind, if that does crop up in practice, um, there is, uh, in certain circumstances, way of dealing with that by way of a statutory will in the Court of Protection. So, first dealing with construction. Well, what do we mean by construction? Because it usually uh, crops up within the context of commercial documents, contracts. What we are really concerned with when we talk about the construction of the will is really what is the true meaning of that will or its various clauses? So how are we going to interpret that particular will? And construction of a will can be quite a complicated exercise, but it's important to have an understanding of how a court approaches that for a number of reasons. The first reason is that if a will is quite frankly poorly drafted, it can lead to it being ambiguous. And the consequence of that is that that can lead to various financial outcomes for different individuals. And perhaps it's best for me to highlight that by way of a practical example. So I've just put here what on the face of it seems to be a fairly typical clause dealing with a gift of the uh, residuary estate. So I give the rest of my estate to my executors and trustees to hold on trust to pay my debts, taxes and testamentary expenses and pay the residue to, and this is the important bit, A, B, the living grandchildren of A and C in equal shares seems fairly simple on the face of it, but when you actually analyse that, there are potentially a number of different ways of interpreting that particular clause. One way of interpreting it, or certainly where there's some ambiguity, is are we inheriting C or C's grandchildren? And you'll see that because it says the living grandchildren of A and C in equal shares. To me, it's not clear 
But then we've also got the question of, well, the grandchildren that are entitled to a share, are they entitled to a share each that is equal to those that A and B inherit? Or are the grandchildren to inherit a share equal to A and B? And then within that share, they then inherit their own equal share. So you can see that there are a number of different interpretations and it could ultimately be a case if this were a disputed case of C's grandchildren either inheriting a large share or nothing at all. So you can see how depending on the financial um, investment of the particular beneficiary in a particular interpretation it is rife to lead to a hot dispute between individuals. Now, what I did here is just adjusted ever so slightly the grammar and the punctuation. So you will see that it has exactly the same until it says to pay the residue to A, B, and the living grandchildren of A and C in equal shares. So what I've done there is I have added the and in bold, and then I have removed the comma that comes after the living grandchildren of A. Two relatively minor um, additions or, or omissions, but the consequence of that, I think, is that it makes the interpretation much clearer because it makes it clear, in my view, that the residue is to be left to A, B, and the grandchildren of A and the grandchildren of C all in equal share. So you can see how just minor tweaks and what might be seen as quite loose drafting can quite dramatically change um, the interpretation of a will. Now, a second reason why it's really important to understand how significant varying interpretations can be on a will is this. If you are acting for an executor, and there is uncertainty about the way in which the will is to be interpreted. Well, they need some guidance certainly on how they should proceed. And it's important because if you have an executor who makes a particular interpretation of a will, they go ahead and distribute on the basis of their interpretation. Two years down the line, it transpires that their interpretation was actually incorrect. Well, the consequence of that is that the beneficiaries who have lost out, who are then coming back to make a claim, uh, may, way, may well have uh, a breach of trust claim against those personal representatives. And in all likelihood, they will be personally liable for distributions that they were never entitled to make. So it's important to get clarity for your personal representatives when there is an ambiguous will. So you find yourself acting for a PR and you think, well, this will is on the face of it ambiguous and there are a number of different interpretations. So what do you do and how do you move forward with it? Well, the starting point is, of course, always the legal test for the construction of a will. And a useful starting point for you all would be to go and read the case of Marlin Hallings, which was a judgment of the Supreme Court in 2014. It sets out quite clearly within that case that the approach that we have on the construction of a will is identical to that that we have uh, when we are looking at the construction of a uh, document, so a contractual document. So the first key point is that what we're looking at and we're trying, when we're trying to ascertain the interpretation of the will, what was the intention of the testator? That's the first key point. But how do we go about doing that? Well, we go about doing that by looking at these sub factors here. So we look at the natural meaning of the words that are used, the overall purpose of the will. Are there any other clauses in the will that help us interpret that particular clause with which we're concerned? And we also look at the facts that are known or assumed by the testator at the, at the time of the will's execution. Uh, and as always, uh, a good dose of common sense. Now, one example I think might be useful is you have two testators, they are married and they both have children from previous 
marriages, they make mirror wills and within their wills, they use the term issue um, routinely. And of course, to you and I, issue ordinarily means children or descendants. But within the substitute clauses, the individuals that are listed actually include stepchildren who are not ordinarily classed as issue. So what a court will do there is it will look at the entirety of the will to see was the testator intending to include as issue his or her stepchildren. And if the testator were, then it may lend itself to a court saying, well, even though issue to another person might mean something different, in the context of this will, looking at the entirety of it, issue actually extends to include stepchildren. Now that may be different in a different case because these are all, as they often are, fact sensitive. Now the second point, once we've looked at the intention, or, well, or certainly when looking at the intention, is the starting point is to ignore the subjective evidence of the testator's intentions. And what I mean by that is we don't, as a starting point, look at the extrinsic evidence. So your starting point is to focus on the will itself and what that tells us. Now, there are limited circumstances in which the court can look at evidence from outside the will. And those exceptions are contained within section 21 of the Administration of Justice Act 1982. And it sets out there the triggers for when a court has the power to look at evidence outside of the will. And they are contained there. So is any part of the will meaningless? Is any of the language used ambiguous on the face of it? And if the will falls within those subsections, then a court can look at the extrinsic evidence, and that's when it can be fairly useful. And what I mean by extrinsic evidence, evidence of what the testator told the drafter of the will, so attendance notes, the will file, any notes that the testator made themselves, very often testators or clients will send in a letter before they meet with the list to say this is the, these are the things that I would like to achieve by this will. Also any earlier drafts of a will that the testator approved. All those nuggets of evidence are extrinsic evidence and can be taken into account when we interpret a will, but only if section 21 is triggered. The overarching point really is when you're faced with a will that is ambiguous and one person interprets it in one way and another in a different way, what your task really is to do is to sit in what we call the testator's armchair and looking at it with that testator's knowledge and belief, what were they really trying to achieve? What was their intention in making this particular will? And we have an example of that in the case of Brooke and Huntley. I'm going to uh, run through this fairly speedily, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, <clears throat> it was a testator who had a large um, portfolio of business assets. He wanted to divide his estate amongst his five children, but he was concerned about their ability to man manage uh, the inheritance uh, in the future because of the scale of it. After advice, he was told to uh, arrange a discretionary trust so that the business assets would pass to the trustees and they would manage it. The summary of the will recorded that and it was clear from the will file that that was the testator's intention. However, the final format of the will, which was used, which was prepared using a precedent, brought about a conclusion or an, uh, an ultimate effect, which was one that the testator didn't want. And the Long and short of it was the way in which the will was drafted meant that those business assets couldn't ultimately pass into the trust. And what the drafter did was included these two particular clauses, which were effectively diametrically opposed because 613 uh, meant that the business assets couldn't pass in to the nil rate band discretionary trust. And so what the court did was it looked at the intention of the testator, 
It looked at the extrinsic evidence because section 21 was triggered. In particular, the summary form of the will, where it was abundantly clear that the testator wanted the business assets in particular to go into the trust. And then there was a fairly candid concession from the drafter who said that she used a precedent without realizing it was inappropriate. So recognizing that the will was contrary to the intention of the testator, what it did was it effectively um, struck off clause 6131. And that is the way in which it construed the will. So what do you do if you're faced with a will that is ambiguous? Well, the starting point is to consult with the beneficiaries. What's their view on it? Um, is there some form of agreement which may lend itself to the beneficiaries varying the will to rectify that error? But if they don't agree, then what you have to think about, certainly as a personal representative, is to bring a part eight claim under part 64. Now that is a claim that is uh, almost always brought by the executors in this type of case. What you will need to do is include as defendants all those individuals who are interested parties. So it's going to be your beneficiaries. But remember this, you may have groups of beneficiaries each advocating a different interpretation of the will. If that's right, you don't always need to add every single one of them. You can have one beneficiary uh, standing in place of each particular group. Now there may be, or there is an alternative way of dealing with construction claims rather than a contested part eight claim. You can seek a part eight claim application, but one where there aren't any defendants to the application. And what has to support that application is an opinion from Chancery Council uh, with uh, advice on the construction of that will. And what the court can do is make a declaration that the personal representatives are entitled to distribute on a, the basis of that construction. It's almost like a Benjamin order where the PRs are authorised to make distributions when certain beneficiaries can't be uh, found, for example. What you've got to be mindful of there, dealing with in that way is pretty rare. And it's rare because even though the court has sanctioned a way of dealing with it, it's not going to bind those beneficiaries if they later want to come back and suggest an alternative construction, because of course they've not had the opportunity to advance their case on how it should be interpreted. Now that's significant if you have a personal representative who is also a beneficiary, because it may transpire that a few years down the line, a beneficiary comes out the woodwork and says, actually this interpretation is the correct interpretation. And if a court agreed with that, notwithstanding the earlier order, that new beneficiary could have tracing claims against the beneficiaries to whom the estate had originally been administered. So you could find yourself as a beneficiary and PR on the receiving end of a tracing claim. So I don't ordinarily advocate that way of dealing with it, but it's there just in case. So moving on to rectification. Now, the way I like to pitch it with this about the difference between construction and rectification is that Construction is dealing with an ambiguous will where the drafting is a little bit loose. Rectification is where when you read the will, it's abundantly clear what it's saying, but that there are quite clear errors in it and errors that mean that the will doesn't reflect the intention of the testator. So try and think of it in that way when you're thinking about the difference, because sometimes uh, it can be a little bit difficult to understand the difference. And we've got quite a, a, a pithy expression of what um, rectification uh, is there. What I will say is that very often um, the two claims do go hand in hand in the sense that rectification is very often uh, an alternative to a construction claim. And I'll, I'll say in a moment why that is. But the way of perhaps um, showing it to you um, as easy as I can do is by way of an example. So a testator makes a gift of her property to a colleague in clause four of her will. 
Uh, and she also makes a number of pecuniary legacies to a number of individuals uh, in clause six. And as part of clause six, uh, four, she makes a pecuniary legacy in addition to the gift of her property to Paul. She executes that will. Subsequently, the testator and Paul fall out. And so the testator instructs her solicitor to draft a codicil removing the gifts to Paul, but leaving the rest of the will as it is. Now, the codicil should say that um, the testator was revoking clauses four and six, four, because they're the only ones that affect the gifts to Paul. But actually, the codicil simply says that she is revoking clauses four and six. So the effect of that, of course, is to revoke all those pecuniary legacies. Now, the testator gave it a quick scan. The solicitor who drafted the will knew that that is what the testator wanted to achieve, but just hadn't picked up on the error. So in those circumstances, what the personal representatives, when that error um, came to their attention post-death, they'd be looking at whether there was scope to make an application under section 20 of the 1982 Act. And that is where the court's power to rectify a will comes from. And it says that if a court is satisfied that a will is so expressed that it fails to carry out the testator's intentions, so that's always the key word, intentions, in consequence of the clerical error or a failure to understand his instructions, it may order that the will should be rectified so as to carry out his intentions. So I've broken that framework down for you. So the first key point is that the will so expressed must fail to carry out T's intentions. Now, that leads to two points. The first is you need to know what the construction or the interpretation of the will is first before you consider rectification. The second is that we are dealing with valid wills. We cannot rectify an invalid will. So section 20 cannot be used to correct a mistake in really the execution of the will. And the third point is that the cause of that failure to carry out the intention has to fall into two discrete um, areas. The first, is a clerical error and the second is a failure to understand the testator's instructions. So those are um, some questions that I've put as a framework I think to approach if this ever comes across your desk. So what were the testator's intentions? Well it was clearly to revoke the gifts that affect Paul and nobody else. Does the way in which the will is expressed fail to carry out those intentions? Well clearly they do because they revoke all the gifts, the pecuniary legacies that affect everybody else. And is the way in which the will is expressed as a result of a clerical error or a failure on the part of someone to whom the testator gave instructions to understand those instructions? So I'm going to deal with those now. Um, and where the um, lack of clarity has been before is, well, what is a clerical error? And that um, was considered in the case of Marley that I mentioned right at the beginning of the construction part of this um, talk. And I think these are the key points to take away from what a clerical error is. The first is that we give that a broad interpretation. So that's quite helpful to us all if we find ourselves in that position. The second is that the idea about the court's power to rectify is really to try and save a will. So if there's a way to do it, the court will endeavor to do so. The third is that set out at the bottom is that mistakes rising out of office work of a relatively routine nature, such as preparing, filing, sending, and organizing the execution of will, of a will, uh, that is a clerical error. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, um, in my experience, um, that um, includes the following. So if you cut and paste the wrong clause from a precedent into your will, if you insert the wrong word, or the wrong figure, um, if there is a slip of the pen or a mistyping uh, in a particular sentence. Really, what it's there to cover is that where the drafter failed to delete something from the draft or left something in that they intended to take out. 
So that should hopefully give um, a good starting point for how we approach a clerical error. Failure to understand instructions, that's less common. The key point there is at the, the end is that the hurdle is usually showing that the testator hasn't changed their mind between the point of giving instruction and the actual execution of the will. So some examples, and I think this, this is quite helpful to show what the, how far the courts are willing to stretch it on rectification. So here we had, um, I'm going to whisk through these just because of the time, um, here we had a testator who wanted to um, give the residue of estate into six equal shares, dividing those between his five siblings equally, six share was then to be subdivided between five nieces and nephews. Um, the way the will was drafted is that it effectively left an equal share to all 10 beneficiaries. The attendance note quite clearly recorded that that was what the testator wanted to achieve. But the error was either when the solicitor tated the will to his or her secretary or the secretary mistyped. And the court found that there was a clear clerical error arising out of office work. And the court went on to say that it was an obvious clerical error. So it was either the secretary just simply mistyped or the solicitor um, misrecorded the terms of the will when he was dictating. Marley's an interesting one. The solicitor inadvertently passed the mirror wills for a husband and wife to the wrong testator. So they ended up signing each other's will. The Supreme Court agreed that that was a clerical error. Uh, we've also got ones here. For example, um, Joshi and Mahida, the testator had a 50% share in his property that he wanted to leave to his brother. And the will referred to one half of my share being left to brother and nephew, but then was silent on the other um, share. So it fell into the residue. Um, the wording was, as you can see, effectively in the wrong order. So um, that was rectified to reflect the testator's intention. Uh, what you have to be mindful of is that rectification doesn't cover poor drafting and it doesn't cover where someone is drafting a will and they just aren't experienced enough and they've used the wrong type of terms without understanding the consequences of that. The key thing to take away is there is a time limit. Like Inheritance Act claims, you've got six months from the date uh, of the grant of probate being obtained. If it's outside that period, you can seek the court's permission and you invariably have to, because as I say, rectification claims are usually an alternative to a construction claim. Now, construction claims don't have the strict time limit that a rectification claim has. So they are very often made beyond six months. So by the time you've made it, your rectification claim is out of date. So you just have to, as part of that, seek the court's permission. And the court will very often approach it in the same way that it approaches a Section 4 application in Inheritance Act claim. So it will consider the re criteria. So has there been a, a distribution? What's the strength of the claim? Um, have negotiations started? But generally, in my experience, courts will adopt a much more flexible approach to extending the time limit in rectification claims than it will with Inheritance Act claims. Procedure. Um, so again, consult with the beneficiaries. If there is agreement amongst the beneficiaries, you can make an application under Rule 55 of the non-contentious probate rules. If there are disagreements, then you can, if you're going to do it separately to a construction claim, bring a Part 57 probate claim. But ordinarily, as I say, they are go hand in hand, so you very often end up tacking it on to the Part 8 claim of construction. Uh, costs, well, um, as always, the court has a wide discretion under Part 44. Um, very often, the root cause of the dispute will be because someone has not drafted the will in the way that they should have. And so always think about, is the solicitor or um, the will drafter responsible for this situation? If they are, very often they will pay the costs or contribute towards the costs. And they will ask you as part of your mitigation in any professional negligence claim to bring one of these claims. Um, 
there's also um, very often it's the estate that pays. And of course, if somebody unmeritoriously advances a case or doesn't give appropriate consideration to ADR, um, which of course, um, in every case I have, I always um, think about the merit of a mediation. There is always the scope for the court to make one of the parties pay for the application uh, if it has been unmeritoriously brought or unmeritoriously defended. So there is a, an overview. I've only gone over by seven minutes, Paul, this time. So, so what I'm going to do now is pass over to Paul um, and I'm going to, I think I have to unmute him. There you go. There you go. You can share your slides now. Right. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about post-death variations, uh, what it is, how it arises, and what the consequences can be. The reason why I chose this topic is I come across all sorts of uh, deeds of variation and things that people have tried to do with estates and got them profoundly wrong. Either they under misunderstand what really a variation is, they try to do things they can't really do, um, and don't understand how you actually write it back for IHT and CGT purposes. So given the time limit, I haven't got an awful lot of time to talk about this this afternoon. So I want to give a, a framework in which that sort of thought pr the processes can be thought of uh, and what you need to do to achieve any particular outcome. So the first point, and then bear with me with technology as I tend to, it could all go horribly wrong. Right. First question is, what is a variation? A variation is, is simply is not a difficult concept. It is a concept by which you have one beneficiary who, for whatever reason, wants to divest either in total or in part the interest that they've inherited. Now, this can be either done by them making a gift or by exchanging uh, gifts or in some cases you can sell the asset and give away the proceeds of sale. They can all amount to a variation. Now, if we just skip to slide four, this is the important thing bear, to bear in mind. If somebody does just that in relation to a gift that they've received, that is a transfer for value for IHT purposes and a disposal for CGT. You can so that will have implications for both IHT and CGT for the person, for the original beneficiary. If, however, you want to write that back so that the gift is not the original beneficiary, but the deceased, then you have to comply uh, with 160, 142 of the IHT Act and 62 of the CGT Act. And we'll come on to look at that. So the principles to think about, if we go back to our variation as to what is a variation. At the end of Skyfall, James Bond is given a pot dog by M. And that is, that's his legacy that he receives from her. In the film, it makes it abundantly clear that he can't stand the damn thing. Um, and so he probably isn't likely to keep it for very long. As it is an absolute gift to him, he has total possession of it. He's free to give that away, do what he wants. And that's a matter for him. What he doesn't have to do is to seek permission from the PRs, from Spectre, from Blofeld, or from anybody else. It's just simply his to do with as he pleases. Likewise, he may think, actually, Money Penny was left a rather nice bronze of Churchill she likes the dog, I like the bronze, why don't we do a swap? They're in perfectly entitled to do that and again they don't need to involve anybody else in the process. But like I said, 
for the purposes of IHT and CGT, that is a transfer of value and a disposal of an asset for both individually of James Bond and Money Penny. Normally, if it was a particularly valuable asset, James Bond would be creating a pet for IHT purposes. It may be that he thinks his chances of living for seven years are fairly limited, being that he is licensed to kill and people try to kill him all the time. So you might think what is better than rather than being responsible for this, uh, for creating a pet, it would be better if this was written back for tax purposes, both his and uh, the estate generally, and that it was as if M uh, redirected the gift. So the upshot of that is, in terms of variations, it's important to separate the two. There are variations which parties can do and are free to do, and they are as if they are their, their gift and their gift alone. But then it's only if you want it to have certain tax consequences that you need to follow certain other provisions. And this is where the confusion often arises. So what are the advantages of making a variation? It is a way of which a beneficiary can control how uh, or the ultimate recipient of the gift that was originally given to them it can be made either during the administration of an estate or even after so in other words the estate can be fully administered uh, and yet you can still make a variation at that point and then the final thing it can have in certain circumstances retrospective effect for both iht and cgt purposes and I'll come on and deal with those two for it. Now, why would you want to do that? The reasons why you might want to do that is uh, any number of reasons. One is someone might simply not want the gift, might not, not have no need for it. They may want think it would be fairer if the clock that they've been given their sister or whoever always thought that that was going to go to them and it may be more appropriate that they get that gift. So you can redirect resources, you can have greater equality between the beneficiaries, in other words say you have someone who only gets a, a rather small portion or a specific legacy then as between beneficiaries you can level it up so that there's a greater division between beneficiaries and in certain circumstances you can make tax savings and I set out there a number of possibilities of how you can go about that but that's assuming again each of those is on the basis that you've complied with 142 and they've written those back for the purposes of IHT. The other thing you can do and this is something that Faye touched on is that you can it is a way sort of in which you can correct or you can rectify the will However, you have to exercise extreme caution in that because one of the things it is not, if I find the right bit of, of what a variation isn't. It isn't a method of rewriting uh, a deceased's will or of drafting the intestacy rules or correcting, correcting a defective will. Although it can be, I slightly have to caveat that. The reason I say that is, if to use one of Faye's an anal analysis, you are looking at a will where the ultimate uh, resting point for a gift is unclear because of the wording of a will. You cannot correct that, which would either be a matter of construction or a rectification claim, by a uh, variation. Simply because in order for there to be a variation, you have to have be clear as to on whom or with whom the final gift rests. If there is an ambiguity between A and point B, you could make a variation where B gives away their gift in total or part but there could then still be a construction summons 
and the court could go, could say actually the gift didn't go to A, it went to B, in which case the variation has been wholly ineffective as a mechanism for uh, dealing with the variation. And you also see when it comes to section 142, one of the things that you've got to comply with is you've got to specify the gift that's been varied from where it's coming to to where it's going to. So again, there's a limited scope in that respect as to uh, creating a fundamental error or a uh, rather confusing will by means of a variation. Um, couple of things to be aware of. One of the things, uh, and I'll come on to this one, consider assets. The assets that can be subject to a variation, one of them is a joint tenancy. You can sever and redistribute the joint tenancy where that's passed by survivorship, but you have to be careful that you understand as long as you've complied with everything, that'll work for the for IHT and CGT purposes but of course in property law you can't retrospectively sever a joint tenancy. There is guidance on the land registry's uh, website as to what their view of it is. Um, that is in deals with uh, nil rate band discretionary trusts but essentially it sets out what the position is and effectively what you have to do is create a new trust from the date for it to work. The other thing to be wary of is, or what you can do as an alternative, is a simple disclaimer. A disclaimer is, is whereby somebody just simply refuses their gift in total before they've had any benefit whatsoever and you disclaim from date uh, from day one. That now is on a statutory footing and it has the effect, if a proper disclaimer, of um, the person who disclaimed is deemed to have died just before the testator. So whichever gift they disclaimed would pass as it would all would do under the will or the rules of intestacy to whoever is next entitled to it. So those are two things that you just need to bear in mind. The other thing to bear in mind is in relation to income tax because even if you the headline figure for this is even if you want to write back for CGT and IHT purposes the income tax rules do not allow for it so that's something to bear in mind a lot of the times it won't make much of a difference but depending on the size of the estate and when that takes place it may do because somebody may get stung with quite a large income tax bill, even though ultimately they've disposed of their assets. Um, and the reason for that is, as I set out there, the tax treatment is different in relation to both a pecuniary legacy, a specific legacy, and a residuary beneficiary. And the time at when income tax is due and payable varies depending upon the nature of it. Given the time, I'm not going to spend too long worrying about that just to bear in mind that that's something you need to uh, think about. Now assuming that you want to for whatever reason um, utilize say an unused nil rate band or give a gift to charities to uh, to lower the overall uh, tax of an estate and you want to do that back as if it's the testator themselves who've made this, you've got to comply, as I say, with 142 or 62 of the Inheritance Act or the Chargeable Gains Act. But both in broadly the same terms, and it has to be as follows. It has to be in writing, made by the individual who benefits or would benefit under the will or intestacy rules, but is giving up that benefit be made within two years of the deceased's death, indicate clearly which disposition, that is the benefit inherited, is the subject of the variation and that, it, that the variation changes the destination of the disposition. 
that is that it sends it somewhere else basically it's got to carry a statement of intent and it cannot be made for consideration or money's worth that comes from outside of the estate and i'll deal with each of those points uh, in turn in terms of been in writing strictly that means there isn't any need for it to be by deed frequently it is by deed um, and frequently you would have a deed executed by the person who is uh, giving effect to the variation or to the giving away their gift but the only person who really needs to be involved as I hope I kind of explained from the start in relation to my uh, example is the person who is actually swapping either giving away their benefit or swapping it with the other it's just the, the people themselves that would need to be involved it may be um, in practice as I say it's normally done by deed and it's there's a, a number of reasons firstly is the issue of consideration it, you can run into enforcement problems um, for want of consideration that's obviously avoided if it's by deed and again you don't want to fall foul of the anti-avoidance provision which is the consideration from outside the estate it's important to say just whilst look going through these things if your variation falls foul of any one of these requirements then the revenue will simply discount it as having the effect of going back as if the testator it will be a it will still be a variation but it will be a variation as i've explained before of the individual beneficiary and the tax consequences that would follow would be the consequences for that individual not the overall estate planning that you are hoping or tax saving that you are hoping to achieve overall the other reason why you might uh, want the personal executives involved is if the estate is in the process of being administered effectively if you haven't if the beneficiary hasn't received their legacy that simply shows in action and what they're seeking to do is to assign that shows in action now pursuant to section 136 of the law of property act 1925 to be a legal assignment to the shows in action it needs to be in writing and you need to give notice the purpose of having the PRs in those circumstances parties to the deed is that is effectively giving them notice of the legal assignment so that's why you would do it if it's going to be an equitable assignment again it's it's beneficial to have the PRs involved the only other time that you need to have the PRs involved is if the effect of the variation is going to be an increase in the overall level of taxation for IHT purposes and CGT if it's going to be involve more tax which it can do if, I, if the purpose of the variation isn't, for example, tax saving as a whole, but maybe either to uh, settle a 75 Act claim or to level up the beneficiaries. If it's actually going to mean that the estate needs to pay more money, then the um, PRs need have to be a party to the deed. So, varying, oh, the next one, two years. It has to be, the variation has to be within two years from the date of death. It is not, and this is very important, two years from the date of grant, which is, I've seen quite a few people try to do. It's two years from date of death. The revenue don't allow two years and a couple of days or anything it is strict time limit you're either in the two years or you're not to that effect though it doesn't matter whether the estate is partially uh, administered or wholly administered you can still do it within that time frame and then dealing with the 
uh, needs to indicate. What the revenue says is you've got to set out which provision is being varied by reference to the specific will and redirect it so that it's clear that it's going somewhere else other than the original beneficiary. And to that extent, if you refer to a legacy to be varied, but you do not refer to the will in which that legacy is made, the revenue will treat that as failing to identify the original interest. So in terms of drafting your deed of variation, you've got to make sure that you say you want to vary such and such gift at clause so and so of the will dated and make it clear that that is the gift that you are seeking to change. In terms of um, a statement of intent, that's simply a clause in the deed itself that says it is intended that this has the consequences set out in section 142 or 626 whichever is you're wanting to apply it can be one it can be the other or it can be both but the document the deed has to have that statement of intent because then otherwise again the revenue will simply reject it and the other thing that you cannot do is have the consideration for the deal be money, as I say, outside the estate. The simple way to think about it is, say you've got two people who are gonna swap the value of um, their gift or swap their gifts. Say one's been left the house, one's been left the residuary estate. One wants the house, one wants the residuary estate. So they're gonna swap them over. The value of the house is considerably more than the value of the residuary estate. So the other person agrees, well, I'll pay the 200,000 pounds or whatever difference, and that way we're all, we're even. Again, you cannot do that you've, because that is money outside uh, the value uh, of the estate. So you can swap and the, and the consideration can be the swap of another gift, but you can't do that equalizing of funds. The other thing is, um, if you want to vary it so that to, to benefit from the 10% rate that you get if you've given, um, sorry, the 36% rate if you've given 10% of the net estate to charity, which you can do, what you've got to make sure that you do and the, is that uh, you've got to notify the charity in question, because until, as you see there by section 23, section 40, 142 will only apply if HMRC receives confirmation that the appropriate person has been notified. And that's the same in respect of all gifts for charitable persons. For some reason, the, char the HMRC is very skeptical of all these gifts to charity they will not believe that you are intending to give 10% of the net estate to a charity just on the say so of a deed because they think well what actually you're trying to do is just save the tax and the gift might never go so you have to notify of the vary the charity in question of the variation and either that's the trustees or the charity itself and charities been the nice friendly organizations that they are we'll write lots of hate-filled letters within seconds saying, where's our money, please pay it straight away. And that is in relation to all gifts to charity for any variation, it's not just the 10%, hence the underlining section at the bottom. Now, which assets can be redirected? Essentially, almost any. So it's assets that pa pass outside the will, such as joint, uh, by survivorship or nominated assets. It's any assets that immediately before the estate were part of the death. And importantly, it's also excluded property as defined by section five of the Inheritance Tax Act. So the definition is slightly wider uh, than potentially it would be. Now you can vary a will so as to create a trust that's not a problem 
Um, I just want to come on because it sort of ties in the two talks in a, in a round holistic kind of way. How often can you do a variation? Um, as, as I'm in the realm of films, as Highlander says, there can be only one. You can only have one variation of one asset in any, at any particular time. You can clearly have multiple variations of multiple assets, but contained in one deed. That's not a problem. But you can only have one variation of one asset at any particular time. This has serious consequences for solicitors in terms of the consequences for drafting a deed and getting it wrong. If you get it wrong, and then you try to do a, a deed of rectification, the revenue will not allow it. Because that, they say, is trying to do do variations. The only possibility then is a claim for rectification along the lines of what Faye has outlined, but then that can only succeed where the mistake was about the legal effect of the document, not about the tax consequences. So if you get it wrong, and what you intended was to have these great tax saving provisions, but you've just got that wrong and it doesn't have that effect, then a rectification claim isn't going to help you. The Ashcroft and Barnsdale is actually a good case that I cite there, is a good example of that. That's a case of his honour, Judge Hodge. Um, the fortunate thing or the unfortunate thing for the solicitors was the deed of variation was just such a disaster that it was actually what his honour was doing was correcting the document to reflect what the parties were trying to do. It wasn't a mistake as to the consequences that they were trying to achieve. And it's, it's a slight variation, but or a slight, it's a subtle difference but it's important and so again as if it's not for a prudent solicitor it makes it all the more important to understand a that the drafting does what you want it to do and that the tax if consequences of achieving those uh, variations are as you expect because you're not likely to get another chance at it um, I'm aware of the time. So let me just deal with this final point, which is whether or not, in all cases, the retrospective effect for IHT and CGT is necessarily uh, appropriate. And of course, the simple answer is, is no, it isn't. Um, again, there's a tendency to think because it can be done, then it should be done. And if there is going to be a variation, it should be done as if the testator is the one who is going to vary. But there are reasons why it may be more sensible to do it simply as a variation and for the beneficiary to take the tax consequences. And again, on that slide, I set out um, one of the circumstances where it may be uh, sensible just to leave it with the beneficiary if the pet is, is, is going to be uh, it's likely to survive for uh, seven years and there's not any problems in terms of tax generally. So again, uh, set out the reasons there. Variation of trusts. In the long form of my talk, which I gave last time, I dealt with the variation of trusts. Given the time, I don't intend to deal with that. Clearly, other than to say, there's the Saunders and Vautier point, which is, is good trust law in all cases. In other words, if all the beneficiaries are over 18, have capacity and in agreement, then you can do whatever you like with the trust. So again, you can uh, vary it as to beneficiaries, winding it up, do whatever you like. The difficulties arise with trusts where you have either trusts for minors or unborn people or people with who lack capacity. They clearly, because of their nature, cannot give consent. Therefore, you will need to get consent from the court under the Variation of Trusts Act 1958 
on behalf of those groups that can't otherwise consent and you will only get that if the variation is for their benefit the number of times i see schemes devised but the effect of the scheme is that minors or unborn children are simply written out of the trust and then they expect to go to the court and for the court to agree that that's for their benefit the court will never agree that it is for a minor's benefit that his mother should get his interest 15 years before he would acquire his absolute interest it's just not going to happen but um i have lots of slides on variation of trusts um but it is almost a topic in itself and i don't intend to go there today you'd be all glad to know so um i think i'll leave it there and we'll go back to the to slide one as to what a variation is so thank you all for listening and i'll hand over to Faye if i can sort myself out somehow stop share that's what i need to do there we go hopefully you can all hear me uh now um so so that is the end of um our seminar thank you very much for coming um i forgot to remind you at the beginning that the seminar is actually being recorded and so if you do want to share the seminar with your colleagues who weren't able to attend or go back at a later date to refresh your memory then um, it will be available i'm told it's going to be on youtube i'll double check that because it may well be that we send the link out um, as part of the emails where we send out all the slides and Paul's um, PDFs. But just to reiterate that we are here to answer any queries on any wills, trusts and probate matters that you have. We remain open for business as the rest of you all do. Um, please do um, suggest to us any topics that you want us to deal with in the future. And I'm told also that some feedback forms will be sent out to you also. So we'd be very, very grateful if you would take the time to fill those in and send them back to us. But other than that, it just leaves me to thank you all for um, attending today's seminar. And uh, we hope you have enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you.